Okay, so I got a box of uh, Buffalo River chert, heat treated chert, uh, a while ago, and I've been saving this up. Uh, I wasn't going to do any videos on it, I was just going to make points for my friend Randy in exchange for the box and stuff. Um, but I'm going to make some points. Uh, let's see. I got a request for a Clovis, so, so I'm going to make that one. So I just wanted to show you this stuff is relatively plentiful, as far as I can tell. I mean, there are there are spots in northeast Mississippi, Alabama, and northwest Alabama, and south central Tennessee that have a lot of this stuff. They also have Horse Creek, Fort Payne shirt, and similar materials. And there's a lot of this. So I encourage you guys to look up this stuff and figure out how to heat treat it. Now, Randy has a kiln. I'm not sure what, what temperature he uses, but... I think he's got like a pottery kiln. Those work really well because I, I think this requires more than 500 degrees. Could be wrong on that. But it's excellent material once it's heat treated. And that's what I made the Dalton out of in the last video. Okay, so I will do a Clovis. In this video, I wanted to show you the pieces that I have. They're not, you know, they're not really large. They're large enough for me, but for somebody that wants to see huge pieces being napped down, I don't have any of those, except one. And I'm going to save this when I'm off camera because I don't want to mess it up. Um, doing things on camera is a lot more challenging, so I don't want to mess it up. Okay. Just looking for a good piece for that Clovis. That might be good. Let's see. For the uh, Dalton, I used a pattern I made a long time ago uh, that I came up with an average size, right? This base is a little bit uh, deep. So it's a little, it's a little bit uh, not average. The base is really, really deep. But I used it as a kind of a pattern. But for Clovis, I do have some casts, okay? I'll be making more Clovises on video. Now, there's one of obsidian. This is a cast. It's plastic. But this is what an obsidian Clovis looks like. The, the site says... Uh, um, I can't read it, actually. Maybe you guys can read that. I, I can read the deets. Esther Green deets. I don't know if that's the person who discovered it or if that's the site. The site's probably 35 LK. All right. So I'm going to try to make one like this. The Clovis that I made is a little bit different. I like this oval shape better than the parallel sided shape but I'll make a parallel sided shape Clovis just to be more consistent with with this one all right so I've got that one I'm also got a Texas Clovis only fluted on one side this is a cast only fluted on one side Pretty beefy. Multiple thinning flakes. And there was one last one that didn't go anywhere. I was just used to thin it a little bit. And there's one from, let's see, it says lamb. Now, I don't know if that's the lamb site. Yeah, these are all from Lithics Casting Lab. This one's going to be difficult to reproduce for me, uh, just because I don't have enough practice with these thinning, this type of thinning flake. And then I got one from Virginia. Yeah, 
Now this this guy is smart because he didn't go for the the really big thinning flakes. He went for the multiple thinning flakes. I say he's smart because that's, that's what I'm going to do on this one. I think <laughs> I'm going to do this type of thinning flakes. I think uh, because heat treated material, if you try to flute it or drive a really long thinning flake, it, it'll dive into the material and ruin your whole piece. Right? If it doesn't go all the way through, you're going to have still going to have a, a big weakness if it starts to dive. So it's safer to do these multiple thinning flakes. Now, I don't know what material this, uh, the original is. This is a plastic cast, uh, and the, the plastic is dyed or pigmented to resemble the original material, but it's not exact. But yeah, this uh, strategy with multiple thinning flakes is cool. The base is irregular, as you can see. Uh, it is, you know, rather, rather thin. Probably not uh, mounted deeper in the notch than what I have here. The four shafts for Clovis were probably deeply notched because they do have a dulled area that goes quite a ways up the blade. Okay, so this is not unreasonable for the piece I chose. Let's see. I think I have enough room for this. Yeah. And if not, I'll just pick another piece out. I can pick out this other piece too. Now, not all of this Buffalo River chert is consistent. Some of it's easier to nap than others. And uh, no, I'm not going to use Abo tools on this. If you want to see the Abo tool stuff, go to my Allergic Hobbit channel. Or just type in Jack Crafty Abo as a YouTube search and you can see the the Abo videos on my Jack Crafty this one here this channel here okay now why don't I do all my videos with Abo tools because Abo tools for me are expensive now I have some friends that have been very gracious and sent me plenty of antler. So now I do have lots of antler, but I wear them down quick. I don't know if it's my style or what. And like I said in one of my previous videos, making the tools is my least favorite part of flint napping. And it makes me not want to flint nap when I'm looking at the prospect of making a bunch of new tools or dressing the old ones because they they're worn down or the antler that i've got is subpar because it is a natural material you can't really predict how good it's going to be for flint napping uh, i've got a bunch of antler tines now but some of them are going to be crumbly some of them are going to be splintery uh the ones I have, I'm lucky that the latest batch that I got uh, were cut from the skull. So those are not going to be splintery. Those are going to be hard and very uh, consistent, I think. But if, you, if you're picking up sheds, unless they're very fresh, they may be subpar for flint napping. The best uh, antler for flint napping is the hard brown antler. And I think that's classified that way on eBay or wherever you might want to buy antler. And usually buying the dog chews is the cheapest way to buy antler. Although the dog chew people have gotten smart and they know to also put flint napping in the search or in the title so you can search for it. It makes it more expensive if it's for flint nappers. So they've gotten they've they've wised up. They've gotten into the 
into the market for the flint napping tool stuff. All right, so I think I have plenty of room for this type of Clovis. And, but, you know, I'll try to make a nice clean flute, at least on one side, and not do this to you guys. A lot of you guys are very partial to the beautiful clean flutes like this. All right? I mean, I like those too, but this is rare. Okay. Yeah, every time I every time I do a spalling video or discuss stone, someone asks me where can I get stone? It's so expensive or there's it seems like nobody is selling any or it's 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 very rare. This stuff, I believe, is extremely common. It just needs to be heat treated. So look into it for sure. And you guys that have, like, access to literally tens of dozens of tons of this stuff, you know, make it known that you're able to get it and sell it. I don't know if tens of dozens make sense, but I know some, I know at least one guy, it's not Randy, it's another guy who has access to literally tons of this. Okay. But you know, it's something you know, it's gonna be hard to make a living selling it, so that's why he doesn't do it. But the more popular it becomes, the easier it is for you guys to get it. Because then it becomes profitable to, to sell it, even though it's not much per pound. Okay. If you sell enough pounds of it, you're in business. All right. I don't know how easy that's going to be to flute. I'm going to do it with percussion, like always. I've never used a jig to f do any fluting, and I don't plan to start doing it. So I said a lot in the beginning of the video, I'm just kind of rambling. If you want to see this done in Abo tool, I've got, uh, got some really old ones where I use Texas Chert. Some really old videos where I have Texas Chert. And I would, I would wrap it around with leather and then do the fluting. I think I have also some with, you know, just holding it out in the air and then fluting. And then I have, I think I have one with Dacite. I, I did a St. Louis looking type Clovis. I don't know if I did it with Dacite. But just look for those. Uh, they're not all Abo. Not all the Clovises that I've done in the past on this channel have done with Abo tools. So 
look for or type in abo abo jack crafty clovis or whatever and then there's my allergic hobbit channel i just want to repeat that because i always get that question why don't you do abo <laughs> and for those just tuning in i'm going to start doing this every video uh, for you for you guys that have never seen my channel or haven't followed it for a while I started with Abo tools and I switched over to copper because I didn't want to torture myself. <laughs> I developed the, the knee stick because of the inadequacies of using Abo tools. I couldn't get what I needed and the results that I needed. I had to figure out a, a better way, right? So the knee stick started as an uh, antler time. An abo uh, technique. Uh, I just put the antler tine behind my knee and gripped it like this. It was an antler tine. And I was doing it with abo tools. Now, this is before I started making videos. And then I said to myself, you know, I can do it's so much easier to do this technique with copper. So that's what I did. I started developing it with copper and then I started making videos. So my first videos are with the copper tools doing this indirect percussion. And first impressions are everything, right? So the first impression is, oh, I'm just a copper guy who is using this technique. No big deal. No, it started as an abo technique with me. I was using also abo techniques with the rocker punch. I was using an abo rocker punch. It was made of antler with a wooden base. Uh, two sticks actually. Um, as the base for the rocker punch. And I was using, uh, trying to use vertical punches for this kind of stuff instead of a horizontal punch. And you can hold it, you know, the leg pad technique where you can hold a vertical punch and do everything I'm doing and punch it and you know do your thing I did that too and didn't get the results I wanted I did billet work all kinds of antler billets I tried elk moose deer uh, I tried ram's horn. I don't know if I had a low quality ram's horn, but it didn't work very well. It was very light too. I've got some more ram's horn that's it's better. So I'll, I'll break that out. And, it, and when I do, I'll, it'll be on the Allergic Hobbit channel. Uh, I, had, I tried buffalo horn as a percussion instrument. Sounds like a musical instrument as a percussion tool for flint napping and that didn't work well, very well percussion is very uh, stressful on the materials now buffalo horn is okay for pressure flaking I don't use it anymore within with any regularity because for one it is expensive and number number two uh, deer antler works so much better I think just in terms of durability using buffalo horn is like using this type of plastic to flint nap with it's almost exactly the same as this uh, high impact plastic or high let's see what's it called high molecular weight plastic Buffalo horn is almost exactly like this. So imagine cutting this into strips and using it as, as a pressure flicker. That's what buffalo horn is like. Okay. I'm not saying it can't be done, but you know, it's...
something you can surely torture yourself with. If you're into that sort of thing. All right. Or take one for the team and just suffer with it because it's an avo technique. Yay. No. <laughs> So I'm just going to make this uh, as regular as I can, just so, you know, I'm not risking breaking it when I do the thinning on the base. Although I've been rambling and I, I've lost track of what I've been doing. I need to hit specific areas. And I've been losing track. Now Clovis preforms are developed in different ways. It seems like the different cultures had different ways of preparing and finishing Clovis points. That's what it seems like. Which makes it good for us because since it's highly variable, no one's actually doing it wrong. Because you can probably find it, evidence for that particular technique somewhere in the archaeological record. So you can use a lot of indirect percussion. You can, lose a, you can use a lot of direct percussion. You can use a lot of pressure. You can combine them in any different way you want, and you'll probably be correct at least somewhere in the archaeological record, uh, there'll be evidence for that technique. Okay. Now that's not true with all points. Some points, there is evidence, good evidence of certain techniques, but those are, the further, time, further back in time you go, the harder it is to, to, uh, find evidence for the fl flit napping techniques because the materials for flit napping a lot of times are perishable. Antler and bone does not survive very well. And yes, I think antler and bone were the primary tools for flint napping. What about hammer stones? Yes, of course. But hammer stones, uh, at least in my experience, are uh, they're hard to find in the right consistency. It may just be because I don't have access to a lot of it. And that might not have been true back then in the day, in the day, but it takes me a while. I got to gather like 20 hammer stones to get three or four that work well. And they all look pretty much the same. So some are crumbly because of different exposures to different conditions. Some are decaying, right? Some are cracked that will just break, oops, right in the middle or something while you're flint napping because there's an incipient crack or some existing flaw uh, and you know that kind of thing with antler you kill a deer with antler and those antlers are going to be good very rarely are, are you going to uh, take antlers off an animal you just hunted and have them not be good they're pretty reliable And of course the bones are too. And like anything that's natural and you season it yourself, 
because you will have to dry out the bones and you will have to dry out the antler at least a little bit. You can season it yourself and control the process and have pretty good results. A hammer stone, you really don't know what the moisture content is, what the internal flaws are, what the consistency, what the consistency is going to be once it dries out. What if you accidentally, or one of, you know, what if your kids accidentally build a small fire and line their fire with all your hammer stones? <laughs> That's never happened to me. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, but anyway, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway. Those are my thoughts on the tools. Oh yeah, and dogs love to chew on antlers. That's a side note. Or any canine. Like if you have a camp, Native American camp, they did a lot of flint napping. And they left a lot of tools behind for some reason. And then animals move in to see what's what they can scrounge. If any of those discarded flint napping tools were made of antler, those are going to be chewed up by animals. So they're gone. And so the, that's the evidence. So they're just, it's more than just age. There's other things that work to work against finding the tools all right okay so i don't want to make it too thin as you can see it it does kind of break easily i just dished out way too much on that flake or took way too much of a bite off the off the edge. I really don't like thinning when it's like this. I'd rather have it fatter, but I started with a small piece. Uh, with a larger piece like this, I could kind of plan the preform better and then uh, send the flutes uh, from the base while it's wider than this because I can make a, a consistent biface much easier with a bigger piece uh, I don't know if that makes sense and then you know be very careful about the fluting and the thinning from the base here I'm working with a small smaller piece I'm not complaining but there's a slightly different strategy it's more difficult, but anyway, I can do the multiple flakes, but what I'm going to try to do is one clean side and maybe one side with these multiple flakes. How's that? So the, the first, well, I don't know. Sometimes it works out like I can get to do a nice clean flake on the first, first attempt, and then the second attempt... It's going to be more difficult. So I just do shorter or more narrow multiple flakes. I think the first attempt for a fluting flake will be here on this side. That's more regular. And I like that concavity right there. This one, I'm going to have to take down more of the surface and stuff. All right, so I'll continue on the next segment. Okay, so I need to get rid of some of the mass on this side. It's best to have all the mass in the middle, of course. And you guys that have made Clovises or experts at it, you know that a central ridge is the best for a flute. And it makes sense, of course, to follow a ridge with the thinning flake. 
So that's what I'm going to try to do. I gotta take take back this edge because I'm gonna send a thinning flake into here. But while I'm doing that, taking back that edge, I might as well remove some mass that needs to be removed from the other side. See, I ground that down a lot. And I use a coarse abrader. Okay, this is coarse. I don't know what the grit is, 60 some odd. But I always buy the coarse abraders because they're more versatile. If I don't want to take off much material, I just do a light, a light grind. If I want to take off more material, I do a very heavy, forceful grind. You know, uh, the finer grit stones are probably better for smoothing out the platforms but you only get one basically one option no matter how hard or soft you're going to get very fine uh, and very gradual removal of material this i have more range that's why i use coarse i'm not saying that you should i'm just saying that's why i do okay This material flakes really well. Okay. And if you find the narration distracting or stupid, you can just turn it off. Or I do have videos with no narrating. Uh, of course, you'll have to go through and... <laughs> You'll have to uh, listen to them all to f find out which ones don't have the narration. That means I get more views, right? So I'm not going to tell you which ones. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do this one here first. Uh, but I am going to remove, yeah, I'm going to remove this mass here first. <clears throat> okay. I don't have the light on. Yeah, <clears throat> sunny out. The kids got off school early today and they don't have school tomorrow. So that means I don't have to be Mr. Taxi. <clears throat> Although they are taking the bus now. So. Yeah, they they got to walk a little bit, but they can take the bus now. And they're old enough, so it doesn't matter. I can uh, pretty much feel confident they know where they're going and stuff. So it's not... I used to be... Well... I don't hate to say this, but when I was little, we didn't have to worry about walking to school and being safe. I used to walk to school... And uh, these days, I don't know, doesn't feel the same. So now that they're older, I can I feel I feel better that they're walking <clears throat> now. I I didn't feel comfortable having them walk earlier. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see. I need to 
playing this strategy. And okay, so if I do the flutes here now, um, it would be fine, right? I do need to take off that lump. So it is possible to do the flutes at the very end. That's why I'm kind of debating. You know, you can do all the all the basic thinning now and then do the flutes or thinning flakes at the end. And then any intrusive flakes are going to be just from the dressing of the side. You know what I mean? Or you could do the fluting flakes earlier and then have a lot of intrusive flaking for the shaping and the final, for the thinning and the final shaping. I still have lots of thickness left. So I'm not too worried about the diving uh, or snapping it in half when I do the thinning flakes. But I don't want to get stuck with too much mass when it's too thin down here. Sometimes when there's too much mass here and I run a flake, it'll dive, it'll want to dive under the mass. Let's see. But if it's too thin here, it snaps. So there's two different two different things. The reverse hinge problem and the snapping problem. Two separate issues. The safest strategy is to make it very regular. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove lumps. I'm going to remove that lump. I'm going to remove that lump. And I'm going to skin a little bit more off of this lump. Yeah. Stuff is nice for pressure for a pressure flaking. So nice. Okay. All right. So now I got a very nice regular edge. I can hit wherever I want. I do this lazy thing where I grind the whole edge, but it's a continuous platform. When I do it this way. I can hit, and then if I miss, or if I crunch, I can move over a little bit. But it is kind of lazy. All right. So I'm going to remove some of these lumps. Okay. 
and for the juicy ones first. That one slipped off. That platform wasn't, this platform is more beefy than that one. Let's see if this one works. Yeah. This one's a beefy platform up here. Oops, slipped off. Nice solid hit. Okay, so that gives me a little bit, a little bit more confidence that I'll be able to drive a good flute. Yeah. As long as the platform is beefy and uh, I don't hit too hard. And for those of you just tuning in, the surfaces need to be convex all the way from the the platform to the end of where you think the flake is going to go convex the whole way it can be straight a lot of guys do nap off of straight surfaces like the flake over grind folks uh, but it's best to have a convex surface when you're just starting or when you want to be safe I should say that the guys that nap slabs, not flake over grind, because when you grind it, you can grind a convex surface, and a lot of them do. Uh, the slab guys, they'll nap a straight, flat surface, and they're very good at it, so it can be done, obviously. But I recommend to be safe, fully convex, and it goes for obsidian too. Okay, so I took away most of the lumpy areas, and now I'm going to do the thinning flakes for the for the base. Just going to do some setups. And I like a continuous platform for this too. Instead of the isolated platform. Just in case the center one doesn't work right. I can. I might have some options. On this side though I think what I'm going to do is. A couple from the side and one in the center. And that gets rid of that mass here. It's not going to be. A, it's not going to be the final one. Just. Uh, just the preliminary smoothing and flattening of this lumpy area I'll do one more after but to get rid of that lump since I won't be able to get rid of that entirely on the first strike I'll do a, a pass of smaller flakes right and then the main one like I said I was going to do will be here on this side which is a lot more regular flip it over and finish up on that side Yeah, it didn't go very far. That's okay. I wasn't paying attention. I'm going to creep, creep up on it. Well, I think I have... Yeah, that's a very strong platform right there. I think I'll just take a big flake. Bigger than the other ones. Yeah. 
nice All right, so a series of thinning flakes to make that very similar to that side okay very nice and then uh, move the edge to the other side and I'm sure you guys have seen this in other videos I'm pretty much imitating how a lot of the other guys are doing it except maybe for the continuous platform I like a continuous platform even if I'm only doing one central flake I still like a continuous platform just in case that one central flake doesn't work Now what I do is, I'm not always in the exact center when I do the center flake, and this and that's going to be the same. It's going to be the case here. I'm going to take the this big old flake from this platform here, which is a little bit off center. Let's see if I can see how far I can go with it. And then, of course, I'll need to take another one off of here. But hopefully this will be an, a clean one. I can prepare this to get a central, a central isolated platform. But usually I don't. And I, the uh, original Colvis snappers were were uh, sometimes not that particular, right? From looking at the cast. This looks resharpened, so it's not as neat as it would be if it was brand new, probably. But you can see, they were not that particular with the symmetry or the placement of the flaking. Okay. And if you got to do like 10 of these, it does save time to be less than perfect. Okay. I am going to put my finger around the tip. Let's see. And if I don't think about this, I probably will. Okay, I do need to take some off that platform because it's kind of weird. Too strong. So I changed my strategy a little bit. It looked too strong for me. Uh, I felt like I was going to break it if I hit it with enough force. That comes with experience. But I think, I think that's better now. Okay. This it still looks a little thick. It didn't didn't dish out as much as I had hoped. I might have to do another one. Yeah, that's okay. I can do another. 
another flake. Okay. But this narrow flaker is, is probably going to be good enough. Um, a wider flaker may have been may have been better for that. But uh, I'm still going to keep that more narrow flaker. Let's see. You know, I have I have others other flakers. I have the aluminum one from other videos and stuff like that. Let's see. Of course, I have the Antlin ones too. But I'm just going to stick with this. not think about it too much Okay, so now I can talk. All right, so I think that's everything is thin enough to where I can do mostly pressure now to finish it up. I might do some percussion up here. Although on all these casts, the uh, flakes are not very long or not very wide, I should say, on the tip. I lost a little bit of length on there. Because uh, was, I did multiple thinning attempts. But as far as the upper part of the blade, it's a lot of pressure work on these casts. Right, so there isn't any really bold flaking. Some of the, maybe a few on this one. So I'll limit, you know. I'll limit the indirect percussion up on top. Okay. But I think that worked out okay.
Okay, I'll just continue doing the same on the next segment. I'm going to take more of this side off than I am of this side, just so I can center that thinning flake. Yeah, it'll center both of them better. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to continue with the pressure pressure flaking. I'm going to concentrate mainly on this side first so that I can reduce more of this side. And when I first started doing Clovis, I was worried about that particular issue. Do you center the flute after the fact? Or do you try to keep it in the center uh, when you're doing the thinning? And I'm, I'm leaning more toward leaving myself room so that I can center the flute, like leaving room on the sides so I can take down one side or the other to center that thinning flake or that flute instead of, you know, creating perfect sides and then hoping that I'm going to flute directly in the center. So on this one, I am going to manipulate the sides or the margins so that the thinning flake looks centered. And of course that's good for functionality as well. If you're doing a thinning flake so that it's easier to mount in the foreshaft or the knife handle or whatever, then it makes sense to center that after the fact. without having to uh, be worried about getting the perfect thinning flake right in the middle. It just adds to the to the stress. Sorry if I'm out of the frame there. For an actual clovis, I don't need to go much thinner, right? Let's see. Yeah, I don't I don't need to go much thinner than that. But what I'm gonna do is uh, I'll, I've got most of the issues removed from this side as far as step fractures and lumps, but I'll take some off. I'll thin it down more so I can remove these lumps and things. And I'm being very careful to keep these as straight as possible so when I do the final grinding, they'll be nice and straight. The inside of here, I'm not going to worry too much about. Might be a little bit too concave, but I don't care. <laughs> this one here is concave too. But it's more narrow. I should probably take it down more. Yeah, a little bit more. And 
make it less wide.
All right. I was con concentrating on that one. I didn't want to mess that one up. Okay. Tip is still a little bit thick for me. Yeah, just a little bit thick. It needs to go past halfway. Yeah, I'm satisfied with the thickness now. I'm just going to pressure flake the rest of it.
Okay. I was starting to get a little impatient with it toward the end uh, because I was I was thinking that I wasn't going to be able to thin down that tip without losing too much width. I think it I just barely got enough length there. And the thickness is comparable. I've got one clean flake on this side. I think I, I hope this focus in this video was okay because I've have a lot of dust on my side on the viewfinder. So I, I'm having a hard time with the blurriness. It just keeps building up. Uh, when I abrade on this, there's a lot of dust that seems to accumulate on the on the camera. Anyway. Let's see, compared to the distance on the real one, the distance is a little further than mine. See that? Mine doesn't go as far. On well, that one, it did. But not quite. So yeah, comparable in size. The width on mine is a little bit more, but the uh, the middle of the blade looks about looks comparable. Okay, so there you go. A couple of bold flakes just to get it thinner. There, there's a little bit of a bump there, but I didn't want to mess with it. Yeah, a little bit of a bump on each side. Didn't want to mess with that. Okay then. This this abrades and grinds down. This stone abrades really easily, so this is really smooth. This one, it doesn't get really smooth until down here. Well, it is really smooth on this side. This is a little bit sharper than up here than it is down there. Um, I think these casts reflect the sharpness and the dullness pretty well. Yeah, it does. Even on the plastic casts, you can feel the difference between sharpness and dullness. Okay. I really like this material. It's a good change from obsidian. I'll go back to obsidian in a little while. I think I'll go after, go back to obsidian uh, after this. Well, can't say that. There's going to probably be another request. <laughs> All right, so there you go.